Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating yet another stochastic model for time series econometrics, which is the Heston model that he developed and proposed in 1993. The core ingenuity of the Heston model is the use of two distinct stochastic processes for the mean and variance, and that makes the Heston model quite widely applicable to asset price dynamics and even option pricing. The mean equation is nothing too surprising, it's just a regular random walk, with a heteroscedastic volatility term. However, the variance equation is where it becomes quite a bit more exciting. The variance equation utilizes the logic of mean reversion, the onstein ullenbeck process, that we have quite intensively covered for the Vasicek model and the cox inkerson ross model, and you can already recognize the similarity of the variance equation for the Hessen model and the main equation for the CIR model. Here we have got the long-run variance level, theta, that the variance process is assumed to constantly tend towards, and the speed of adjustment, kappa, which is quite similar to how you model interest rates in the Vasicek and Cox and Wilson Ross, and variance is also deemed heteroscedastic, and it uh, behaves uh, according to some random disturbance which is different to the random disturbance of the mean equation. Another uh, interesting property of the Heston model is that we could assume that those processes are independent, but the model also allows to model them as dependent variables with some coefficient of correlation. To uh, keep in mind the fact that shocks to variance and shock to the mean, so shock to the volatility of the asset return and the asset return themselves, could be somehow linked using the logic of hedging or the logic of uncertainty and how it's propagated throughout the financial markets. And that is what makes this model very interesting and non-trivial. Here we have got a set of parameters that the model um, inputs. We have got the long run variance level, the speed of mean reversion that we already discussed. We have got the uh, volatility of variance parameter that shows exactly how um, stochastic the variance component is. We have got the correlation between shocks or innovations to mean and variance equations, the starting level of variance that we plug in at the very first observation, as well as the uh, value of the drift, that is average or expected return. And to optimize this model, we have to use maximum likelihood estimation with the joint probability density, as we have got mean and variance equations separately, and they are correlated with the parameter that we have just discussed. So the optimization is quite a bit more challenging than for other stochastic time series models. And just as there, we cannot really estimate continuous forms of those equations on uh, real world data, so we have to uh, make peace with uh, the different or discrete versions of the same equations. And we will run this uh, model on one year worth of data for the S&P 500 index. So we've got data from uh, year end 2020 until year end 2021. We'll calculate logarithmic daily returns as this is what the uh, mean equation suggests. Again, as it's a, a logarithmic random walk, uh, this model performs better generally when you use logarithmic returns. So the logarithm of the ratio of consecutive index values times 100 then we can assume that our starting value of the drift parameter we'll seek to improve upon is just the average logarithmic return across all sample days. And then we can calculate residuals as basically demeaned returns, referring to the drift parameter and locking the row. Then we could assume that the long run variance equals sample variance, so the sample variance of the residuals. And we can calculate realized variances day by day by just squaring respective residuals. That would allow us to calculate the starting value of the volatility of variance. That would be the sample standard deviation of observed variances day by day. Then, as we assume constant variance as our 
starting specification, and this is where Heston model is quite similar to Gauge. You just assume different forms of conditional uh, volatility processes. We would assume perfect variance mean reversion, which would constitute the parameter of one. It basically would mean that no matter what happens, the next day uh, variance reverts back to the long run value. And if this mean reversion is less than one, that would imply that the mean reversion process is there, but it's not perfect. Variance relaxes back or jumps up to the long run value in uh, several trading days or even maybe weeks. This is what this parameter uh, represents. Then we start with the specification where we assume uh, mean and uh, variance shocks are independent, so correlation of zero, and we plug in the starting variance of the same value as the long run variance, so 0 0.6817. And this is the baseline specification, which will calculate the uh, log likelihood for using the joint probability density, and then we'll seek to improve upon that and measure how statistically significant the improvement that the Heston model gives is. But before that, we need to calculate the expected or conditional variance in each of our sample days, starting with the starting variance parameter, and then utilizing the mean reversion function. So our uh, variance uh, would change by this particular adjustment factor, given the values of kappa and theta. So to the realized variance in the previous day, we would add the kappa parameter, which is the mean reversion speed, times the difference between the long run variance, theta, and the realized variance in the previous day. And here, if we import it all the way down, we would see that kappa equals one does indeed give us the constant variance or the constant volatility specification, as the variance or at least conditional variance always perfectly reflects back to its uh, long run value. And here, just toying around it, if we change kappa to 0 0.5, we'll see that the specification changes and our variance becomes stochastic. And finally, before we start uh, optimizing our parameters, we need to compute log likelihood using this joint probability density function. And we'll always, and we will use the uh, common trick that I showed in multiple videos before, that to uh, speed up convergence and uh, uh, relax our uh, constraints on variables so we don't have to put them manually in solver, we can use the if error function and just return a very large negative value. If there is an error, that would teach the solver or any numerical optimization tool you have to not venture uh, to uh, domains where you uh, have got errors or uh, not well behaved functions. So if error, first we plug in the natural logarithm of one over two times pi times the uh, standard deviation of our uh, x variable. Here it's a mean, so that would be the uh, square root of expected variance times the uh, sigma, the volatility of the second process, which would be the volatility of the variance, that is the constant parameter given here, so we need to lock it. And then we need to multiply it by the square root of one minus correlation, and again it's a constant parameter so it needs to be locked, squared. That finalizes the denominator and we only have to code in the exponent term over here. So we times it by the exponent of minus, and then we open parentheses and uh, account for this particular uh, fraction. So in the numerator of the fraction, we would have the a deviation of x, so the return from its mean or expected value, that would be the residual over here. That would be divided by the square root of the expected variance, and that needs to be squared. Then we subtract two times the correlation, locking the cell here as correlation as a fixed parameter, and times it by the product of Z scores or scaled deviations of both processes, mean and variance. So first we input the same term that we have already accounted for. So we can just copy it and then we can multiply it by the deviation of realized variance from expected variance divided by the 
volatility of variant, which is represented over here, and that's a fixed parameter, so we need to lock it. And finally, we can add on the squared scaled deviation of variant. So it means that we can square this particular component and close the parentheses for the numerator. And then we need to introduce the denominator, which is just two times one minus correlation squared. And then we'll put it into an extra set of parentheses, close the brackets for the exponent function, close the brackets for the log function, and then introduce our if error condition, which would be minus a thousand or some other large negative number in case we encounter an error in our specification. And then we can bottom right click it all the way down and calculate the sum of individual log likelihoods for our baseline specification, which returns minus 694. Let's keep track of this particular value as we would compare it to the value that we would obtain when we optimize the parameters to determine whether the model is statistically significant, whether the model works for S&P 500, whether there is uh, something in the Heston model that is not captured by the constant volatility specification. So now what we have to do is we have to run solver. So we go data, solver, and specify our task. We want our log likelihood to be maximized by changing the cells representing our parameters. And we want to untick uh, this condition as we might want some of our parameters, most notably correlation and drift, to potentially be negative. And uh, even if some parameters should not be negative, we accounted for it by implementing the if error condition. So we don't have to worry about it. And we can stick with judging on linear gradient descent algorithm, click and solve, and wait until the algorithm adjusts to the optimal value. We can see here that the log likelihood has massively improved by almost 17, and the parameters do represent uh, quite an interesting uh, picture. First of all, the correlation is negative, meaning that innovations to mean and variance are inversely related. Whether there is a positive shock, an upward shock to variance, you have uh, a lower return than otherwise. That could represent a flight to quality or shocks to overall uncertainty. That represents um, investors um, discouraged from holding a risky asset, which is a stock, and preferring something like a bond. If we were to use a Heston model to estimate the dynamics of a less risky asset, such as a government bond, you would expect potentially the correlation to be positive. Here it is very consistent with the fact that stocks are generally thought of as riskier assets. We have got a larger drift than otherwise. We have got imperfect, however quite fast, mean reversion of 0.79, meaning that uh, almost uh, instantly, but not perfectly instantly, the variance returns back to its long run level. Our long run variance is slightly smaller than the sample variance, and our starting variance captures a higher residual that we have got in the very first day. However, is this improvement in the log likelihood um, statistically significant? What we can uh, calculate here is the likelihood ratio and apply the chi-squared test to figure out whether the Heston model adds explanatory power to model the dynamics of S&P 500 in terms of mean and variance. So we can uh, multiply two by the difference in log likelihood. So this is the improvement compared to the baseline case, and we have got a likelihood ratio or a chi-squared statistic of 33.95. And then we can apply the right-tailed chi-squared distribution, inputting the likelihood ratio here, and as the number of the degrees of freedom, we'll input the number of parameters in the model. And the number of parameters that we varied is six, as we have got six parameters over here, all of which varied to capture the dynamics of mean and variance for S&P 500. Enforcing this formula, we have got a p-value very close to zero, meaning that indeed the Heston model adds explanatory power on top of the constant variance specification. And that's all there is about the Heston model and its implementation in Excel. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I make to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics topics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.